one of the interesting questions that are thrown around, even in the household, is can I give the same medication for my relative, my parent, my sibling, or my friend, okay, in the office, let's say, or at school, if uh, they suffer the same uh, condition that I have? And uh, for people who have tried it, of course, they might have the answer to that. That is no. Well, so some people take the same drug, they don't get any response. Or for some people, they take the same drug, but they get some kind of exaggerated response. Obviously, that means that even if we already know what the receptors are, what the drugs are, and we assume that the same drug will react to the same receptor to give the same effect from person to person, we don't see that in reality. Because there are things that justify variations in response from person to person, even among relatives. So, first, let's define some terms. We could use first the two very general terms, hyperreactive response and hyperreactive response, to explain lower than or greater than the expected response we would have for a medication. Of course, for hyperreactive, it's like, I take a drug, I'm waiting for something to happen, nothing happens. For hyperreactive, I'm taking my drug, I'm waiting for something to happen, and it comes punching me straight in the face, right? And to elaborate that further, we need to also elaborate these terms, tolerance, dependence, and withdrawal. Tolerance basically means that your body is tolerating the drug. In other words, that means that after some time, so over time, there will be a reduction in the response of your body. For example, I think just as the most common example, coffee. And I'm drinking right now. You can hear my spoon. <sighs> Why is it that, for example, when we were drinking coffee for the first time, okay, probably during our, uh, our years of puberty, when you, when you drink a cup of coffee, we, we, we really get uh, awake, right? Don't get to sleep. But now, probably once you, you hit somewhere in your 20s, you're like, oh, I'm taking coffee. Oh, it's not doing anything to me. That we could say that your body has tolerated coffee, or at least the caffeine in coffee. That um, what used to work before, your body was like so used to it, and then it was like, oh, it doesn't work on me anymore this time. That's tolerance, okay? And that could also apply to coffee and cold medications, and even uh, in, in even drugs for conditions like asthma. Dependence, on the other hand, means that your body needs the drug to avoid some adverse effects. AE stands for adverse effects. Meaning, the only reason why you're taking that drug is not really for you to get more benefit out of it compared to what you have before, but to avoid some bad thing going on. Okay, Because for drugs that can cause dependence, once you stop taking it all at once, what you could get is something called withdrawal effects or rebound effects. Okay, for example, um, one of the most common effects for some sedatives is rebound insomnia. Meaning, there are some drugs that make you sleep that at one point you have to keep taking them so that you could keep sleeping. Because the moment you stop it immediately, um, you would get the exact opposite effect. That is, you will stay awake for extended periods, which, which is the opposite of what's supposed to happen when you're taking the drug. Okay? And usually, the withdrawal effect or the rebound effect is more powerful than before, before you were taking the drug. So, for example, before you were taking some sleeping pills, you can't sleep. And then you take the sleeping pills, you get to sleep. But once you abruptly stop taking it, you can't sleep again, and it's even worse than before you started taking those pills. So, of course, withdrawal effects or rebound effects are usually scary words. Also take note that not all drugs really cause dependence, and not all drugs have uh, significant withdrawal effects. And uh, if there are, then I will have to mention it along the way. One thing is for sure, there are many reasons, molecularly speaking, on the molecular level, that explains both hyper and hyperreactive responses, and I will try to give some of those. First, enzyme irregularities could contribute to hypo or hyperreactive responses. 
That means that some people could have excess or more often deficiency of a certain enzyme that we don't expect to change in levels. Okay? For example, let's say that we look at this receptor. M stands for muscarinic. We will have a day or a different recording for, for this one. But muscarinic receptors are one of the main targets of the neurotransmitter called acetylcholine. And one of the effects of acetylcholine binding to, to some muscarinic receptors, actually, this is wrong, um, to, to other receptors, it should, it should be actually the other one, are a variety of effects, let me just mention in general. And one of the other receptors, it should actually be nicotinic, so one of the other receptors, the nicotinic receptors, once acetylcholine binds to it, is that it will cause muscle contraction. In some cases, you don't want muscle contraction, especially prior to surgery. That's why a drug called succinylcholine, or here I abbreviated it as SCH, could block acetylcholine and compete for it at this receptor so that there will, there will be some kind of relaxation going on. Now, there are some patients who have an abnormally low level of the enzyme that breaks down succinylcholine called BCHA. Okay? And what does that mean? Normally, for a person without that deficiency, the dose of succinyl given, uh, succinylcholine given to them would be enough. But if I don't know that my patient has deficiency of this enzyme, we could actually unexpected and we don't know that it's actually the case that the succinylcholine given to the to that patient is too high that it will cause life-threatening adverse effects and this is an example of enzyme irregularity which you should know prior to giving the dose of this medication otherwise this would happen another example is that hypothetically if we have let's say the deficiency of an enzyme called alpha glucosidase the efficacy of a drug called acarbose would go down. Why? Normally, um, alpha-glucosidase is responsible for breaking down starch into glucose. Remember, in people with diabetes, the glucose levels are excessively high. And we could say that this hormone could contribute to that in some patients. Thus, if I have a acarbose, which would block this enzyme, then I would actually be able to prevent that increase in glucose by breakdown of starch in food. However, what if, and only what if, I have a patient which has abnormally low levels of alpha-glucosidase. That means that even if I give that patient a carbose, the, and the carbose is like, hey, give me the alpha-glucosidase, where's that? I want to fight that enzyme. And they're like, where's my enemy? And there's no enemy. In that case, do you think this would work? No. In this case, if I have a deficiency of this enzyme, the efficacy or the power of the drug that I'm giving would actually be diminished. So this is another example wherein it's the opposite this time around. I could get a hyperreactive response. For the case a while ago of BCHE deficiency, it's a hyperreactive response. So notice that enzyme irregularities could give you both hypo or hyperreactive responses. It depends on the scenario. Now, other than enzyme irregularities, you could also have something to do with the changes in receptor number. And this is uh, adapt adaptive, meaning it's not inborn. Enzyme irregularities are usually inborn, meaning a, 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 a baby would be born with deficiency of this one or this one. But for most of us, we could have changes in receptor number. And I think let's go back to that caffeine example. Okay, Remember, of course... Uh, 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 whatever receptors are uh, responsible for keeping us awake, definitely they have some constitutive activity. So let's assume the yellow dots here are the receptors that keep us awake. And even without drinking coffee, we would wake up in the morning, right? However, by getting caffeine, let's just assume that the green ones here are caffeine, we would even improve that activity and we would become even more awake, right? So if I'm going to use this plot, it would be like, Right? This is the constitutive activity. This is our receptors keeping us awake even without coffee. Once you drink coffee, the caffeine will spike that up and you will be even more awake. So that's plus antagonist. However, our body will actually make an attempt to reach homeostasis. Your body would be like, hey, I'm sensing there's something weird. Why is it that the body is, we are so alive. Why is it we're so awake? That's just not, that's not supposed to happen. And your body is like, no, 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 no. This is too high of a level. We need to eventually go down. And as a response, 
in order to go down, your body will actually reduce the number of these receptors being produced. So that from this many, it now becomes this few. And that is a process called down regulation. It's trying to lower down the number of receptors because it felt like the agonist was really making the activity way too high for its own good. Now, the moment that you have downgraded it or downregulated it and the agonist coffee is still there, you're now back to normal. And this is what we're talking about. Like, um, why is it eventually over time people tolerate coffee? It's because of the phenomenon of downregulation. And this is the worst part. And people with caffeine withdrawal have experienced this. I've been a victim of that many times already. Isn't it that when you stop taking coffee abruptly, after you have become tolerant to it, isn't it you really suffer a lot? Personally, I suffer from a lot of headaches. I sleep a lot and I feel like I'm so tired. That is actually my withdrawal effect. And that's because the moment I stop taking coffee, my activity goes even below the original activity. And that's really a bad feeling. Okay? Now, conversely, what if instead of an agonist, I give an antagonist? So let's say, uh, let's say these are the receptors keeping you awake, and then let's say these are uh, sedative drugs, right? A sedative, so they're supposed to oppose this. So initially, this is the constitutive activity, I'm awake, and then I give my antagonist, so I get sleep, right? Then your body is like, why is my, why are these being suppressed? This cannot be suppressed. We need to neutralize that. How do you go back to the normal constitutive activity? Uh, we need to overpower the antagonist. So the receptors become even more in amount. So because from here, it goes up to this number, this process is called upregulation. And when you have upregulated it, you now go back to the level of the constitutive activity. However, this is the problem. What if you stop taking sleeping pills eventually? That's right. Once you stop this antagonist, taking this antagonist, your, your, your wakefulness will exceed even more than what you had initially. And this is what I was talking about, the rebound insomnia. If you can sleep before taking those pills, the more you can even sleep when you get the withdrawal effects. So uh, hopefully you understand here, based on my diagrams, how homeostasis is being achieved and where down or up regulation goes in the conversation. Now, sometimes there are receptor structure changes, although remember this, usually the structure of the protein that acts as a receptor barely changes in humans because humans don't really have that level of cap or that capability to mutate their proteins. The only ones with the capability to do that are bacteria. So that, for example, and as we, I think a lot of us are hearing this, uh, what antibiotics used to work a decade or two before don't work anymore today. And, uh, and the, these receptor structure changes contribute to the so-called antimicrobial resistance. I will deal more about this phenomenon uh, when we deal with antibiotics. But finally, I would also like to mention that enzyme irregularities may not be directly related to, for example, if this is the drug, this is an enzyme directly related to that drug. No, sometimes it could be found upstream or downstream a certain pathway. For example, for example, I'm showing you the RAS. If you have no idea of what the RAS is or you're, you forgot it, it would be nice if you review it a little bit, though I will have a separate discussion for this. But RAS is a way for your body to increase your blood pressure. So usually this is a response to moments wherein your blood pressure is uh, abnormally low. However, if uh, the RAS becomes abnormal itself, it could actually cause hypertension. One of the antihypertensive medications present in the market, at least in some countries, is aliskiren, and it blocks an enzyme called renin, which is part of the RAS. So note this, even though aliskiren blocks an enzyme here at the top, it eventually affects everything below it. Okay? So if I block this, then I won't reach this point where the blood pressure goes up. However, what if I have a patient who has an abnormally low level of ACE. What would happen? Now, if I have a patient, a patient with low levels of this enzyme, it's not related to renin. Uh, it's not renin, right? But since ACE is related to renin via this entire pathway, 
Aliskarin will not be as effective because like, hey, in the first place, this enzyme is not working properly. So even without taking this medication, this arrow downward is not really working. So people with low levels of ACE don't really have a proper RAS to start with. So even if you give something like Aliskarin, it's not going to do anything because everything here is malfunctioning. Just like the same thing I explained a, a while ago with Alpha-glucosidase. And as you can see, sometimes explanations for variation in response from person to person could be very complicated. But at least you have an idea that a lot of, his, of, a lot of it has to do with genetic uh, changes or irregularities in enzymes as well as your body's uh, up and down regulation of receptors over time.